Hello and welcome to EcoTalk, the show where we meet people working hard to conserve biodiversity. Today we're joined by Dr. Jeff Oxford from the University of York and the British Arachnological Society. Thank you very much for joining us today. You're welcome. So I'd like to start by asking you about the British Arachnological Society itself. So what does the society do and what are its aims? Well, let's call it the BAS for short, yes. shall we? <laughs> yeah, it's much easier. Uh, it's the only charity in Britain dedicated uh, to the study of spiders and their relatives, harvestmen and pseudo-scorpions or false scorpions. So how could people find out more about the society and can they join it? Oh, indeed, yes. Uh, we have at the moment about 630 members, 75% of, of whom are based in Britain and the rest all around the world. Um, it's easy to join, it's cheap, and it's for anyone who's interested at all in knowing more about the fascinating topic of spiders and their relatives. I understand you also run spider identification workshops at local venues in York. Why do you think it's important that people learn about arachnids, and in particular, spiders? Well, I'm passionate about enthusing people about spiders. I'm, I'm an enthusiast, and um, I just like to be evangelical about it. <laughs> um, spiders are very misunderstood, and um, it's, if people know just a little bit more about them, then I think they feel a lot more comfortable uh, being around spiders. Yeah. Do you get people... <sighs> Is there a lot of demand for the workshops? Oh yes, uh, each year. I run two workshops shops in York each year uh, with a maximum number of participants of 10 and we normally get 10 to each of them. So there is a demand out there for more information about spiders. Ah, brilliant. And is it is it kind of um, nature enthusiasts who come or is it people from all walks? It, it, it's a whole range of people. I mean, clearly people... to have to have a sort of nugget of interest in the first place but um, I very frequently get one or two arachnophobes who have forced themselves <laughs> along to see if they can sort out their fears and usually when they leave they say to me that they, they actually are, are, feel better about spiders because they know more about them and I think this is the critical thing they've looked at them at live spiders under a microscope, they've appreciated their structures and their beauty, yeah. <laughs> and they feel happier about spiders. What drew you into the field of spider research? It was by accident, really. I did my PhD at Liverpool um, on genetics of snails, and that involved dissecting snails and mashing up their um, tissues and extracting proteins. So quite a long involved process and I thought wouldn't it be wonderful to find an organism whereby you could just tell their genetics by looking at them and I happened across a, a spider that has three different colour forms which are genetically controlled and I thought ah oh, there we are <laughs> so that's what got me into spiders in the first place. Was, was your first project with those spiders with the three different colour morphs? Oh yes, um, so the, uh, I, I began to ask the question, what was it that controlled the frequencies of the different colour forms in populations? And that turned out to be really quite a, a thorny problem, and we still really don't know the answer to that. But we do know that the variation in the spiders is maintained by natural selection, and we also know that at the local level, chance plays a major role in determining the frequencies of the yellow and the striped and the plain red forms of spider. So can you tell us a bit about your, your current work that you're involved in? Have you moved on from the comb-footed spiders onto something else? Or? Well, I haven't really moved on <laughs> um, in the sense that I'm still interested in colour variation in spiders. Hmm. But the, the number of species involved in that has expanded. Yeah. So they now include the happy face spider in Hawaii, uh, a species in California, um, and more recently a species that's found um, in Chile. And what's fascinating about them is that they are all highly variable for colour. Mm. And the question is, why is it, what is it about these particular spiders that um, makes it advantageous to have um, many different colour forms? 
And the second really interesting point is that in these different spiders, which belong to the same family but are quite distantly related, hmm. the same colour forms keep recurring. Huh. And that is absolutely fascinating. So that's what we're interested in at the moment. Can I... Uh ask you about the was it the happy face spider happy face spider the, yes the spiders get a, sometimes a bad reputation amongst uh, well everyone yeah what, why is it a happy face spider does it look like it's got a happy face well it does it's a tiny spider about oh five millimeters long um it occurs only in hawaii and four of the hawaiian islands and it occurs high up in the rainforest on the volcanoes there um and as I say, it had a, has many colour forms, about 20 in total. So wow. it's, it's what I've called an, an exuberant polymorphism. <laughs> um, and one of the colour forms, um, if you turn the spider up the right way, has a, a sort of curved red uh, sickle-shaped mark, which looks like a mouth. Ah. And above it, there are two black dots, which look like eyes. <laughs> And so the locals call it the happy face spider. Mm. And it's really important because it's, it's become an icon of invertebrate conservation in Hawaii. Mm. Everyone knows about the Hawaiian honey creeper birds um, uh, uh, and other organisms uh, that are really endangered on Hawaii. Mm. But no one worries much about the invertebrates. Yeah. But the happy face spider is such a sort of... Cheerful chap, as it were. Car poster. Yes, a charismatic yeah. uh, sort of panda, if you like, of the uh, <laughs> of the arachnid world. That you can buy T-shirts with happy face spiders on, oh, wow. glow in the dark earrings, <laughs> um, badges, uh, baseball caps, everything that's got happy face spiders on. So it's mm. a real ambassador for spider conservation in Hawaii. A uh, pretty big question, but can you give us uh, an overview of the roles that spiders play in ecosystems? Well, in Britain, we have 670, near enough, species of spider, all of which are carnivorous. So inevitably, they have an effect on their prey population, which um, is mostly insects, uh, many of which are uh, a, a pest to humans, like house flies, aphids, mosquitoes, midges, and so on. So they do play a major role as predators. The, the density of spiders um, is absolutely amazing. Um, it's been estimated, for example, in a, a square metre of grassland, uh, there may be between 500 and 800 spiders wow. per square metre. <laughs> And uh, in the late 1930s, a chap called Bristow estimated how much food the spiders in Britain ate per year. So he took an estimate of about 500 per square metre of grassland and multiplied it up. Um, and he assumed that each spider ate a fly um, every three to four days. That's about 100 flies a year. And he worked out the weight of the average fly. And the estimate he came up with was that the spiders of Britain each year ate flies or insects that weighed about the same as the entire human population of Britain. Wow. <laughs> now, since then, of course, the population has grown and, uh, I mean, not only in numbers, but also in average weight. <laughs> yes. uh, and also, of course, the amount of habitat that is available for spiders is diminished. But yeah. anyway, it does give one, uh, it's a very crude estimate, of course, but it does put it in perspective, I think, just how yeah. valuable spiders are in, uh, in eating as I say, insects that, uh, uh, that we may not want around. Hmm, definitely. And are the spiders, in turn, a valuable source of food for other things, for birds? Yes, indeed. Um, many... Uh, vertebrates, um, birds, um, insectivorous mammals, eat spiders, as well as other things, of course. Um, amphibians, reptiles, eat spiders. And of course, there are carnivorous insects as well and, and parasites that also attack spiders. So from that point of view, they're a valuable food for creatures higher up the, the food chain. Yeah. 
And of course, spider silk is used by many birds like long-tailed tits to, to line their nest and to help in the construction of their nests. So it's not just the spider bodies themselves, it's their product, that wonderful product called silk that's useful. Brilliant. Well, we've talked a little bit about sort of spiders' place in the ecosystem's interaction with wildlife. I wonder if I could cover a bit of interaction with humans because yes i said before that spiders don't have the best reputation people a lot of people are scared of them do you any idea why is it is it a sort of innate thing or is it something people pick up for maybe their parents who are also scared of spiders well that's a very interesting question and i don't think we actually know the the full answer to it um some work in the united states suggested that a fear of spiders well, before we start, I mean, a fear of spiders can be from zero fear at all <laughs> through to being totally paralysed by a small photograph <laughs> of a spider. So mm. there's a whole range in between. Mm. And where you draw the line between a little bit windy of spiders to arachnophobia mm. is, tricky. is a tricky one. But the, a study in the States suggested that, um, uh, that there was a, a hereditary component to arachnophobia. Um, it was a twin study, and uh, but the twins, I think, were together in their early childhood. Uh-huh. So, it, well, may it, it may well have been that um, some environmental influence affected both of them. So, I think it's a slightly dodgy study. Yeah. <laughs> but generally, um, people, uh, I think that it's the legginess and the unpredictability of spiders, which they always seem to you know, always always top of their list of why they, they don't like spiders. Yeah. And yet, you know, you can get leggy beetles, hmm. um, leggy flies, crane flies, for example. Yeah. And they're just two legs short of a spider. <laughs> and yet people tend not to be so phased by them. Hmm. But the unpredictability is interesting because uh, when I talk to people about spiders they always say well what really bugs me is when these large house spiders come rushing across the floor which is in in autumn usually and they stop in the middle and these people think that uh, they're they're planning which way to go (laughs) and the truth is that they stop in the middle because they're totally knackered (laughs) they're like cheetahs they can run really fast but for a very short time Mm -hmm. and then they have to stop and effectively you know, have take a, a breath, yeah. have a breath, um, and then they move off again. Mm. Um, but their eyesight is so poor, they probably can't see people sitting there. <laughs> so the idea of them planning which way to go and, and which person to frighten next is just, <laughs> just nonsense. But I think it is that unpredictability. They stop in the middle of the floor, you don't know which way they're going to run next, mm. that spooks people. Yeah, unnerves them a bit. So uh, we've dealt with the, the kind of arachnophobia and the fear, but that can lead to scare stories. <laughs> and one of the things I get asked a lot is, can any of the spiders in the UK bite me? And if they can bite me, are they venomous? Well, the vast majority of spiders in Britain are venomous. The venom is the way they subdue their prey, so that makes sense. Only about half a dozen have fangs at the front end, powerful enough to break human skin. Mm. And those have the potential to inject venom. Uh, The effect of venom, um, if you're bitten, varies from one individual to another, um, from zero. Mm. I mean, I've been bitten by a large house spider and I waited with great interest (laughs) to see what would happen and nothing happened. Um, Other people are more sensitive and they may... There may be local swelling um, and it may be quite painful for a day or so, but that's it. Um, As far as I'm aware, there have been no deaths in Britain as a result of a British spider bite. Mm. Whereas, of course, each year people die of bee stings and wasp stings through anaphylactic shock. And, of course, dog bites kill people each year. And this seems to be sort of just sort of taken as a, a given, whereas... Spider bites seem to be something to, more than to that. worry about. To worry when, when about, really exactly. Happen. Yes. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> one of the scare stories seems to be about false widow spiders. I wonder if you could explain a bit about false widows, where they come from, and if they're anything to worry about, or if they're just another kind of lazy summer news story. 
Yes, false widow spiders um, were introduced into Britain about 100 years ago, uh, probably multiply introduced in with shipping and goods and so on and so forth. And it established on the south coast and it stayed roughly there for decades and decades. Mm. And it's only over the last 15, 20 years it's begun to spread. Um, so people on the south coast didn't notice it. It was no problem whatsoever. It's only since it started to spread that um, people have become worried about it. But like any other British spider, the false widow spider is not aggressive. So it won't come at you to bite you. It will only bite you as a, a last resort. And that will happen if you poke it with a finger or if you accidentally squash it. And... Spiders are, in, in those sorts of situations will try to bite. It's the sort of last thing, last gasp attempt to save themselves. Um, the, the, I, I've already talked about the venom of spiders and the false widow is, is no different. Mm. If you're bitten by one, you may have local swelling, local pain, but that's it. Yeah. So uh, it's nothing to be frightened about. Um, the scare story really is because of its name, the false widow spider, and people think of black widow spiders, which are dangerous. Yeah. But we don't get those in this country, apart from very occasional imports. Uh, the false widow is a relative, it's in the same family, but the power of its venom is very, very much less. So it is nothing to worry about. Unfortunately, that's all we've got time for on today's Eco Talk. Thank you very much, Jeff, for joining us today. You're most welcome. It's been brilliant. Now, if you'd like to learn more about the work of the British Arachnological Society, I urge you to visit their website and also check out the videos that we have produced in partnership with them. So thank you very much for watching and goodbye.